I'd like to sort of give you some background about how I'm thinking about the Boston Olympics, and we'll take it from there. Um, one, of the, one of the stories that we're hearing is that the budget is $4.5 billion. The budget, that they, the budget that they presented at the similar stage in London for the 2012 Olympics was $4 billion. It ended up costing somewhere between $15 and $20 billion in London. If you look at some of the sketchy details, there aren't very many of them, but some of the, the details that have come along with some of their statements, in addition to the $4.5 billion, they say there's another $5 billion that is in the pipeline ideas anyway to improve our transportation system. And then so far, what appears to be left out of the discussion altogether is the operating costs for the 17 game, days of the games themselves. And that comes to, for London, it came to $4.1 billion. Uh, so already, what was being presented as $4.5 billion, we're already identifying costs that are up around $13 billion. One of the things that's true about, about all of the Olympic Games before now is that there are always massive cost overruns. For London, it went from $4 billion up to the 15 to $20 billion range. For Athens, it was at 1.6. This is 2004. 1.6 went up to 16. For Sochi, it was 12, went up to between 50 and 70 billion dollars. Why does this happen? It happens because when the Olympic organizers are trying to convince a, a, a political body to support their ideas, they always come out first with a bare bones sketch of what they want to do. Uh, once there's a political go ahead, then they start adding the frills and the bells and the whistles and the prices go higher and higher. And also when you do the Olympics, there's an enormous amount of construction that goes on and inevitably cities are running up to the last one, two or three years before the games and they're finding that they're behind where they wanted to be and they have to rush things. So they go to construction companies and construction companies for rush jobs charge more money because all of a sudden instead of hiring somebody from the Boston trades who are already fully employed, they have to go to New York State or they have to go to Canada and so on. So they have reasons why they double or not double but maybe go up 50% above the normal prices. And also the, the, the uh, competitive bidding process that is normally carried out for public construction gets thrown out the window because there's rush construction, there's not enough time for it. So you always have massive, massive cost overruns. I think that we could anticipate at the end of the day, even though the budget is 4.5 billion, that we'll be looking at a figure between 15 and 20 billion in today's dollars, not in 2024 dollars. Those might, might be much, much higher. Now, another thing to think about is where the money is going to come from whether it's 15 billion or 20 billion dollars. We've been told by, the, by Mayor Walsh and we've been told by John Fish that there won't be any public money involved here. Uh, we've also been told that they have an insurance policy to guarantee that there won't be public money. It turns out that that insurance policy is for 25 million dollars, million, uh, <laughs> even though the costs we're looking at are in the order of 15 to, to 20 billion dollars. Uh, so one of, one of the problems here is that it's very hard to conceive of where the, pub, where, where the, the private money is going to come from. In London, they were able, through corporate sponsorships, they were able to raise, through international corporate sponsorships, some, somewhere around $320 million that went to the LOCOG, or the London Organizing Committee of the Games. And they also had, from domestic sponsorships, $1.15 billion. So altogether, the private money that supported the London effort came to under $1.5 billion. Again, relative to 15 to 20 billion dollars. Uh, I suspect that today, Boston, Boston 2024 could do something along those lines, along with international sponsorships, and maybe they can raise a billion or two billion dollars that's private. Where is the other 13 or the other 18 billion dollars going to come from? They haven't told us that yet. Uh, I think it's the most important question to ask. And, and very often it's been the case in the past that when corporations and executives from private corporations come forward and they say, uh, I'm a patriot, I love the city, uh, my corporation will provide this amount of money, and my corporation is going to build the Olympic Village, we'll be the developers of the Olympic Village, we'll do it with our money, just let us have it when it's over with. Think about what happened in London. Uh, the, Lo the London Games cost $4.1 billion to operate during the 17 days of the Olympics. That was supposed to be all funded with Olympics money. Uh, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. But it turned out that they fell $1.6 billion short. L the London government had to come up with that money. So that was money that was going to be non-public money, but because they didn't have it, it just didn't appear. There had to be public money at the end of the day. 
Also, they had a private developer that was going to build the Olympic Village uh, in, in the borough near, near the stadium in Stratford. Uh, the private developer turned out to walk away from the project. They had committed to it, but they couldn't finance it. So they walked away. And again, London had to come up with the money. It was $1.8 billion. They were able to, after they built the Olympic Village, they were able to interest a, a, a real estate family, excuse me, a real estate company that's owned by the Qatari ruling family. Uh, and they paid $430 million for an Olympic Village that the city and the national government paid $1.8 billion for. So the, 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 the public treasury, again, lost money. So it's, it's one thing to have a nice idea and to say, OK, the, the private sector is going to cover this. It's another thing to have hard contracts that stipulate and require the private sector to do that. And even when you have hard contracts, there's really ultimately no guarantee, because maybe we'll have another financial crisis. And those companies will either go bankrupt or they'll back out of the contract on, on some other pretext. So what about the Olympic money? So right now I'm talking about maybe a billion and a half or $2 billion that's coming from the private sector and, and a final bill of 15 to $20 billion. What about money from the Olympics itself? London earned seven, about $730 million was their share of the, national, the, the international television money from broadcasting the Olympics. 730 million. That was about the 40%, somewhere between 35 and 40% of the total amount that the IOC took in. They gave London around 730 or 40 million dollars. Then they had the sponsorship money that I talked about, which, which came to under 1.5 billion dollars, and they had 988 million dollars in ticket revenue, and they had 111 million dollars in licensing revenue. You put all that together, including the corporate sponsorship money, and it's 3.25 billion dollars, again, relative to 15 to 20 billion dollars. So point number one again is that you're going to have a tremendous escalation in the cost and point number two is think twice when you're told that there's not going to be public money because at the end of the day the public bodies whether it's at the, at the city level or the state level or the federal level are, are required by the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, to back up in case the private money doesn't, doesn't come through. There are going to be some other costs that will be borne by the city. The one interesting one is that the Olympics, the IOC requires that for a month prior to the games, plus the 17 days during the games, that all of the billboards in Boston, private billboards on the roads, all of the advertising space on the buses, all of the advertising space on the MTA, all of the advertising space at the airports, be available to the IOC for advertising by the international sponsors. So that means that the city of Boston and or the state will have to first of all make deals with the private billboard owners and presumably pay them for the, the use of that space during the roughly two months. Uh, and for the, the MTA and, and other, uh, the public places, the city and or the state will be losing the money that they would get from the advertisers during that period of time. There are a lot of hidden costs like that. There's also a cost in that we're going to be building, or excuse me, Boston will be building uh, at least four major Olympic facilities. Altogether, there are about 35 venues that are used during the competition of the Olympic Olympics. There'll be at least four major ones that are being built from scratch, as I understand it. One of them will be the Olympic Stadium that will require 100 acres. I'm pretty sure that's in the IOC technical manual. You need 100 acres to put the Olympic Stadium on. Because after all, they want it to be pretty. They want there to be a parking lot. They want there to be, want there to be access roads. We'll have to build a, a velodrome for bicycling. We'll have to build an auditorium for swimming. There'll also need to be a, a media center. Apart from that, there'll be renovations for lots of, for lots of other buildings. The four buildings that we're going to have to build, these major buildings, are going to sit on large plots of very scarce urban land. And what it will mean is that you either have to take that building down or it's going to be using up that acreage for decades into the future and precluding other perhaps more profitable use for that, uh, for that land. So that's something else that you have to think about when you talk about the encumbrances and the, the, the obligations that come along with, with hosting the games. So that's on one side. Those are the costs and the obligations and the encumbrances. What's the benefit? Well, we're told every day that one of the benefits is that Boston will become a world-class city. Uh, you know, 
You know, as, as I've heard Chris, Chris Dempsey say many times, we, we believe that Boston already is a world-class city. I've lived here, by the way, even though that, <laughs> even though I teach in Western Mass, I've been here and I believe that. But then there, there's kind of an underlying promise there. The underlying promise is that if we are a world-class city, there'll be benefits that come to us. What are, what are those benefits? Well, the things you most are often hear about are there'll be increases in tourism, there'll be increases in trade, there'll be increases in foreign investment. The scholarly literature on this subject comes to the conclusion that those things don't happen. The people gather the data, they do econometric work, they, they use the appropriate control variables that you want to use, and they come out with the conclusion that we can't identify any statistically significant gains in those areas. Indeed, in the short run with tourism, there's a lot of evidence recently that actually hurts because people from around the state or around New England or around the world hear that there's going to be the Olympics in Boston. Uh, and their reaction is, well, August of 2024 is a terrible time to come to Boston. I'm going to have to deal with higher prices, have to deal with congestion, have to deal with fears I might have about security issues that I wouldn't normally have during the games. And people don't go there. So, Tourism actually fell in the city of London by 5% in 2000, August of 2012 relative to August 2011. In the entire UK, it fell by 6.8%. In China, tourist arrivals during the Olympic month of 2008 fell by 30%. And not only that, but a lot of people who live in the city decide that they don't want to be there either. And they leave the city during the Olympic Games. So you get less tourist money coming in and you get other retail spending going out of the city. Furthermore, those people who do come to the Olympic City to watch the games are sports tourists. They come to, and this is fine, they come to watch the races, they come to watch the relays, they come to watch whatever. And when they go home and tell their friends, relatives, and neighbors, I was at the Boston Olympics, they don't talk about going to the uh, the Boston Gardens. They don't talk about going to Boston museums. They don't talk about the, the glories of Boston that typical tourists talk about when they go back. If a typical tourist goes back and talks about the inherent value of Boston tourism, then they can turn other people on. In fact, tourism works best. The best advertising is word of mouth. They go back and turn other people on. They say, I want to go to Boston also. I want to see the North End. I want to see the US Constitution, whatever it is. But if they go to the Olympics and they go home and I saw, they say, I saw this great competition in the 100 yard dash or the 100 meter dash, uh, nobody can come to Boston and watch that again. It's already happened and it's not here anymore. So what, what actually happens when every time that you replace a typical tourist, a normal tourist, with an Olympic tourist, you're losing the advertising effect of word of mouth. And that actually hurts tourism in the long run. So, on one side, we have these costs. And on the other side, it's very hard to identify what the benefits are. And I think that at the end of the day, that's why Boston 2024 has been reluctant to share information with us. I think one of the, you know, the most important things that, that no Boston Olympics can do is to insist upon the release of the documents that were shared with, with the USOC. Uh, and, and to insist upon an open discussion of these costs and benefits because there's nothing, there's, there's nothing you're going to lose in that discussion. There's nothing that you're going to lose in that debate.